test, test. Good morning. Thank you, Bill. I know if you were watching the countdown, you said, wait, there's still four minutes and 43 seconds to go, but that was just a technical reset. So good to have everyone here this morning. If you're looking around and wondering, where's all my neighbors? Well, they partied at 930, all right? We had over 50 people at the outdoor service this morning drive in and sitting out on the sidewalk and in the side yard. So just envision those 50 people are here with you today worshiping, and it feels really good. It feels really good. Also, if you're sitting here thinking, it feels a little bit temperature-wise, Bob, like it does outside, that's because, you know, when you need something, that's when you don't have it. Yes. We needed air today. We don't have it. All right? So anyway, that's the situation, but we'll be okay. We'll worship anyway. Dan. He'll cool things down just a little <laughs> bit for us, I'm sure. Pastor Dan, it's all yours. Well, good morning. Um, what is different about our chancel this morning? We have camels. We have camels. Hey. Plenty camel. of camel. Trivia. Company. Trivia. Do you know what a group of camels is called? No, I do not. Is it a herd? Is it a flock? Bill, do you know? Ah, it is a caravan. Ah. Ah. Aha. So the caravan is coming tonight. Yes. Yes. We're getting ready for vacation Bible school. So I hope that we're going to be bringing some grandkids and some kids and having fun. We're going to sing songs. We'll meet here in 6 o'clock down the hallway for the fellowship hall which has got all the tents set up and you're going to go down there and get a chance to meet Moses and find out about his wilderness experience and then games outside we've got some young people here to help and also hopefully plenty of children so come join us and if you're a youth or a youths come and join us also we can use your help as we're going to be learning a lot of fun songs Next Sunday is uh, going to be Trek Sunday, so we'll be getting ready to, to commission and send off our Trek campers, 15 uh, young people heading off to Trek camp. And we're so pleased with uh, our continued support for camp and conference. We're sending over 20 kids to summer camp this year, 
And that's a wonderful ministry of this church. Who went to camp as a kid? Went to summer camp. All right. Not, not a bunch of you. I might need to ship some of you off to summer camp. So it's never too late to uh, gather around the campfire and sing Pass It On and uh, have that camp experience. But it is, it's pivotal um, for a lot of young people. And I don't know if you were here when Emily Shepard was ordained into ministry two weeks ago, but she shared a story about her calling into ministry. And what she said was that she was at summer camp. And she had an opportunity to step into a circle, to make a commitment to faith. And now we've got a, a minister of the Disciples of Christ out there, Emily Shepard, because maybe partially because of that moment where she heard God's voice. I hope you're going to hear God's voice this morning as we worship together. It's an exciting Sunday to be back together and to be with one another. So let's worship together. Let's do so and let's stand and sing. This is the day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day we can share together. Would you join with me in our call to worship? Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Instead, their delight is in the law of the Lord. The faithful meditate on the ways of God both day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water. Their leaves do not wither and they prosper. For God watches over the way of the righteousness. Come, let us draw near to God and to worship in his name as we join together in a beautiful song that a lot of us learned at camp, Pass It On. together in the singing of the Lord's Prayer. How about your unity prayer first? How about the unity prayer? <laughs> then we'll switch the order <laughs> Man, up I'm like, and do the Lord's Prayer. How about together prayer? in the unity prayer? Excuse me. Together. Dear God, you, you are, are the, the shepherd, shepherd of, of our souls. souls. You, you lead, lead us, us to green pastures. pastures. You, you teach, teach us what is good and profitable in your sight. sight. As, As your, your son has shown compassion to the people of Galilee, you show compassion to us. So we ask you to forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, heal our infirmities, and deliver us from our trials. We ask these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. And let us join in the singing of the Lord's Prayer. Yes. Our Father, which art in Thy will. 
us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory seated. Let's uh, come to the Lord in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, as we come together on this beautiful Sunday morning, our prayer is so universal. First of all, Lord, just, just help us to clear our hearts and minds for a moment. We, we walked into the sanctuary today as we do so many Sunday mornings with concerns about work next week and anxieties about how we're going to pay the bills and worries about our sister, our brother, concerns about our marriage, concerns about our workplace, fears about our nation and world. Lord, could we just, um, for a moment, just clear our hearts, clear our minds, and just be fully in this moment, fully in a time of worship. And Lord, as we just maybe clear out some of that clutter, some of that anxiety, some of those fears, can we just allow ourselves, Lord, to just receive this moment as a moment of grace and peace and beauty. God, here we are. We're here with people we know in our church family. We're here with maybe a family member or a friend. We're here with someone that we've met before, and we're together, and we're worshiping. We live in a world and a nation where we can worship, and Lord, we can appreciate that we are in a safe space where we can focus on you. Lord, now that we've kind of put you in the center of this moment, we're going to offer to you, Lord, concerns and knowing that you are the God who guides and directs our lives. Lord, take a look and be with our brothers, be with our sisters, be with our kids, be with the people who we know and care about. Lord, there's someone in our sanctuary that's got health concerns. They're concerned about a diagnosis they've had. They're concerned about a procedure that's coming up. Lord, there's someone in our sanctuary that has a mom or a dad that's facing some medical challenges. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers for our mother, for our dad, for our daughter, for our sister. Hear our prayers for the people we love. Lord, we know that you guide and direct our lives in ways we can't always understand, but we know you're there. So continue to be the God who is with us through all the journey of our life. Special weekend for many of our high school students as they're graduating. Some of them graduated several weeks ago. Some graduated, I know in my case, just yesterday. Prayers for our graduates, Lord. They have a long journey in front of them, and the world is continuing to change. And yet, church is here. It's always been here. And as people of faith, we pray that these young people will continue to find ways to be faithful. We know that the things we teach here in church are some of the most important things anyone's ever going to learn. The love of your neighbor, the love of yourself, and the giving of ourselves to God in service. So, Lord, help us to recommit ourselves to that. Finally, Lord, help us to appreciate the person of Christ, our Lord and Savior, the things he taught the ways he taught them, the ways that he was compassionate to those that were often considered outsiders, the ways that he was able to love everyone. Lord, help us to be like Christ, help us to learn from Christ, and help us, Lord, never to forget that we call ourselves Christians, people centered on the life of Christ in all that we do. For we pray this prayer in the power and the glory of his name. Amen. Our children's moments this morning are brought to us from Kay, who is out and about. So we're not quite sure where she's going to be uh, talking to us from, but it's always wonderful to have her be a part of our worship. So this is a moment for our young people, our children. They're going to stay with their parents, but we're going to enjoy our children's moments with Kay. Hi, kids. Kay here in the Rocky Mount National Forest. I miss you. 
You have an exciting week this week, Vacation Bible School. I was really thinking about that when I went on my hike this morning. You're going to discover that Moses led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and into the Promised Land. When my husband and I set out this morning, we wanted to take a short, leisurely kind of hike because we did a big tub hike, 14 miles, yesterday. So we wanted it to be easy. My husband looked at the trail map and he picked one that was just a mile and a half long and went up to a lake. So I grabbed my hiking essentials and off I went, following my husband. We were about a quarter of the way into the hike when I realized it wasn't going to be so easy. The path was rocky and very steep and took a lot of energy and effort. So I asked my husband, hey, did you know what we were getting into? This isn't easy. I'm not prepared for it. Just then I remembered that the Israelites followed Moses into the wilderness and they grumbled and complained, saying, this is hard. Why did you bring us out here? even though really God provided everything they needed. Well, it made me think. It wasn't right for them to blame Moses. He led them out of slavery, and he didn't really know what he was getting into any more than they did. The Israelites were happy enough to follow him so long as it seemed easy. It was each one of their decisions to follow Moses, just like it was my decision to follow my husband on a hike where we didn't really know what we were getting into. I can't blame him. It's really important for us to remember, if we divide, decide to follow someone, that decision is our own. Let's take a moment to pray about that. Dear God, there are lots of paths we could choose. You allow each of us to make our own decision. Help us to always follow you. Amen. Amen, and thank you, Kay, wherever you are out there. <laughs> that was wonderful. I think I recognize a couple of those trails, actually. <laughs> She's right. They're not easy. No. Absolutely. Our scripture today is from the New Testament, Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Norm. All right, well, this is good. Bill's, Bill's hidden behind a camel, so he doesn't have to, have to see my shining face. Let me see if I can get out where I can be seen. So, Scripture this morning said, and no one ever says this, we boast in our what? What did it say in Scripture? You, you, the sentence should say, we boast in our accomplishments. But it doesn't say that, does it? Yeah, that's right. So, only the people that are coming to church and are using this Scripture from lectionary, are going to hear this message this morning. Everyone else is going to walk on the greenway. Everyone else is going to go and have a picnic with their family. And everyone else is going to celebrate. We boast in the things we've done well. We boast in our family. We boast in our car. We boast in our house. We boast in the fact that we're doing pretty good. But guess what? You folks, and myself included, get to hear we boast in our suffering. Oh, no. So there's a story that I saw about a gentleman who decided to take his wife on a cruise. Who's been on a cruise? Okay, so we had a chance to take a cruise long 
hospital. My parents said, you should go on a cruise. And I said, Mom, we don't have any money. She said, we want to help you. And I said, okay. And she said, your father and I are going to come and watch the kids, and you and Allison can go on a cruise. And I said, can you get here in an hour? Because come quick. And off we went on a cruise. Our room was down lower, but we would come up on deck to walk on the trail. Uh, they actually have, you know, where you can walk on an oval. These things are so huge. What really surprised me about a cruise ship, maybe you would say the same thing, was how tall these things are. So you look down, and the ocean is way down there. And some people have a balcony on their room. And we didn't have that, but you can sit down on the balcony and look down at the water. This gentleman and his wife were out on their cruise. He went to bed. She was out on the balcony. And unbelievably, what? He's asleep. Hour later, he's like, where's my wife? Goes to the captain, says, my wife's gone. She must have fallen overboard. They take that huge ship. They turn the whole ship around. And if I'm the captain at that point, I'm thinking, it's been an hour, we're in the ocean, not feeling it. And they go back, and the story, they find this woman swimming in the ocean. They fish her out of the ocean. How did you survive? How did you survive as you watch that huge ship just take off without you? And the woman says, I never lost hope. Now, before you can survive falling off a cruise ship, you best be ready to have a pretty deep well of hope. And you know, when we hear a story like this, I think it's important for each one of us to ask this question, and I hope you will ask it for a minute. Has there been a time in your life when you felt like you lost hope? Has that happened? And you might say, "Mm, first of all, I'm not going to answer. Second of all, I think the answer is no, I've never lost hope. But sometimes in our lives, we feel a sense of hopelessness. And I have had some of those chapters in my life. And, you know, the journey towards a really difficult time of suffering doesn't start so much with the pain. It starts with the mental pain of losing hope. And so today, we're going to be given a formula for how not to lose hope. But it's going to surprise us a little bit what Paul is going to suggest as a mechanism And what we're going to think is that in our society, when we're given this concern about losing hope, then we are given a book that says, here are five steps to happiness. Make sure you follow these. But Paul is going to send us down a whole different direction when he says, the journey towards being filled with hope begins with suffering. It does not be something we want to hear about this morning, okay? Um, So that journey begins, and the formula that he gives for this is he says, suffering, and a lot of us have remembered this formula from Scripture, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Okay, that's the three-part formula that we're given here in Romans chapter 5. Yesterday, I was at graduation for Salem High School at the Civic Center, and as I was there looking at all those graduates, I thought it'd be really neat to ask them, how you doing, how's your day going, and they would say, I'm happy, this is a, this is a great day, I graduate from high school. And so they were, you know, wearing all their tassels and their hats, and they're just, it's a good day. But I thought to myself that those graduates from high school, they may be considered like a lot of people, when you have a, an event like that, you're happy, and you're hopeful, and you're feeling positive. And so I kind of would think of those graduates perhaps like you might think of a thermometer, okay? A thermometer is designed to be able to to tell us the ambient temperature in a room. So for example, right now, if we had a thermometer in our sanctuary, (laughs) we would say, It's 72, and it's getting hotter, so keep moving through this sermon, Dan Denning. Um, But we know that actually, if you go over and you look at the control unit for the sanctuary, it does have a thermometer, which tells us the temperature, but the unit that controls our air conditioning, which isn't working, is also called what? Not a thermometer, but a what? Right, a thermostat. Let's talk about a thermostat. What's it going to do? 
Well, a thermostat is going to actually take control of the temperature. It's going to say, well, here's where the temperature is, but here's where I want that temperature to be. And so a thermostat is a much different unit than just a thermometer. It's in control, okay? And it's going to be able to demand that we either increase or decrease the heat in a room. I think that this is what Paul's starting to say to us. There's plenty of people in the world that have times of hopefulness during moments like graduation, but there's also plenty of people that don't have the roots and the depth to find the kind of hope that we're being advised of today, right? And so how do we go from just being a thermometer to moving into becoming a thermostat? Well, that journey, according to Paul today, happens as we face times of suffering, okay? And the, reason, the word that he uses is that suffering produces endurance. And that word endurance in the Greek is a word that's used to refer to the, um, the ways that we take metal and we add heat to that metal and we purify that metal, okay? So we burn off the impurities. And that's what he's kind of referring to is that suffering helps us to burn off a lot of the impurities that we're carrying around. And, and you could think of it this way. In your imagination, you say, these are the things that make me happy. And these are the things that make me unhappy. I want to spend my time doing things that make me happy. I would like to be happy all the time. But what scripture is going to advise us is that sometimes these things that make you happy are things that are centered on your interests and concerns. And some of these things that make you less happy are centered on service. So this is going to be the sugar fix that gives you a quick happiness. And this is going to be the protein that gives you a slow ability to become stronger and more filled with a deep hope that's Christ-centered. Um, I think that if we were to talk to the graduates from yesterday and we were to say to them, I hope that your future is productive and that you also go through times of suffering, I think the graduates would say, I'm not interested in that, right? And a lot of us would probably be um, critical of that kind of thinking, like, you don't want to walk into suffering. But I think all of us in the sanctuary today know that we have been through times that we found ourselves in a situation of suffering, okay? And as we come through some of those difficult chapters, we find that we are new people with a deeper appreciation for our faith and for the community that supports us during those times. You know, when Paul is giving us this message today, he's not doing it from a position of privilege. He's doing it from a position of a person who also, according to Scripture, was shipwrecked. According to Scripture, was stoned. According to Scripture, was beaten on five different occasions. He's not speaking from a person that was removed from suffering. He's speaking as a person that suffered for Christ. That would be his terminology for what he faced and how he faced it. So he's not um, trying to just give us a formula that says, it's okay for you to suffer, but I'm going to be in a position of um, removal from that. He, he learned from the times that he suffered. So the second thing is this concept that suffering produces character. And, you know, character is one of the most important things that we have in our lives. And this is something that we're here to develop as believers and as Christians. And developing character is... It happens in times of suffering because sometimes as you are in a time of suffering, there's things about the situation you can control. But there's also times in, when you're suffering that is beyond your control. And a person of character learns to say, there's nothing I can do about that, but there are these things that I can do. And one of the, the prayers that we teach the inmates, and a lot of people know this prayer, it's a very powerful prayer, it is a prayer that reminds of that delineation when it says, God, grant me the serenity. We call this the serenity prayer, right? Give, God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So as we go through times of suffering, it helps us to then build character by recognizing that sometimes you just have to take the situation you've been given, and you have to do the best you can with it. Back when I was a kid, and when you were younger, one of the pastimes of people in the United States was bowling, which I don't bowl, but
but I, I have a couple times. Um, and the other pastime, people played cards. Who's still playing bridge out there? I don't know how to play bridge either. No one's playing bridge. Who's playing cards with friends? Okay, so we still have a little bit of that going on. So you would, uh, this is a very important thing that we did. We'd get together with friends, and you would play cards. And it's a lost art because card playing is such a great metaphor for life. And um, I like to play hearts. That's one of my favorite card games. And sometimes uh, when we play hearts, we will pass a card or two to someone. And we call it, you know, here's my junk, right? Because you're trying to better your hand by giving someone. And then what do they give you? Their junk. And it's just this hilarious swap of bad cards. So you're playing cards. You get your hand. You look at it. And what do you think? Dread, right? I've got a bad hand. And so you'll tell your people you're playing cards with, i got a really bad hand. And they're going to laugh and go, we don't care. That's the point, okay? Sometimes in life, you're going to be dealt certain cards, okay? And it's frustrating. You say, well, that's not fair. No, that's the point of a card game. You have to take the cards you've been given, and what do you have to do with that? You've got to play the cards you've been given. But we have kind of this sense of, well, I just want to get a better hand. But each time, each time you get a hand of cards, there's always going to be stuff in there that's kind of, got, you know, you wish you didn't have. And you got to deal with it. And I wish that maybe we played cards a little bit more. And what's fun is when I make the youth play cards, and they don't play cards, they will tell me that this is no fun. And I'll, tell, I'll ask them why. And they'll say, because these cards are no fun to play with, All right. This is what scripture is teaching us today, right? It's teaching us that sense of building character. So we build character, and then, you know, by through this building of character, we start to find that we find hope. Now, the building of character is an ongoing, never-ending process the rest of our lives. And um, I learned about this kind of in a strange way. And it's kind of neat that Kay, not only does Kay show us a video, but she gives us a tour. Now we all feel bad that we're just sitting here in Salem, and she's out in the Rocky Mountain National Park and seeing some amazing stuff. I've had a chance to do a little bit of touring of national parks, and maybe you have too, and I love it. And one time, I had the chance to see Mount Rushmore. Has anyone been able to see Mount Rushmore? Okay. So... Um, I'd heard about Mount Rushmore, seen pictures, got out of the parking lot, and I was the kind of naive guy like, well, if it's so great and grand, where is it, okay? And I don't know if Russ would agree, but when I get out of the parking lot, I could not see anything but parking lot. So I thought, maybe this is kind of a downer parking lot on the sidewalk. The sidewalk has flags that are on either side, and, as you're, and maybe Becky agrees, as I'm walking up this sidewalk and the Flags are flying, then all of a sudden it comes before you, Mount Rushmore. And it's, you just, wow. I mean, really great experience. Um, I went in after I appreciated Mount Rushmore, and in my mind, it was beautiful, not only because it was just this amazing um, profile of individuals that have shaped our country, but because it was carved out of pure stone. Wow, right? This is something that will be here forever and something that maybe someday my kids will get to see. Uh, I went into the museum, and I was a bit surprised. When I got into the museum there, I saw pictures of people repelling down the face of George Washington. And I'm wondering why they're doing that, right? And I see people that are swinging across over to here and coming across over there. And I read in the museum that in order for Mount Uh, Rushmore uh, to be there, it has all this maintenance. Every year people have to come down and they have to pull bird's nests out of people's nostrils. And they've got to go down there with big, huge, uh, you know, uh, caulking guns. And they have to fill in all these small cracks in the rock. And they have to make sure that they do maintenance all the time. If they hadn't done that, those faces would already be gone. And um, if you don't believe that to be a true story, when I was a kid, and again, uh, some of you who have traveled in New England, I used to go up to New Hampshire 
And there was a famous bust that you could see off the profile of a mountain that we called the Man in the Mountain. And you could actually get a patch that had a picture of the Man in the Mountain. It was on T-shirts. And, you know, it was just a well-known attribute. And when you came up the highway, 93, you could just see it right there, Man in the Mountain. His, the Man in the Mountain one day just went completely off the mountain. Like, he's gone, okay? Because that rock formation that was sticking out to make the profile of a face didn't have any maintenance and one day, there's a crack, water, ice, goodbye. So we're glad that Mount Rushmore has people doing the kind of maintenance. And let's just look at the irony of what we're preaching about today. What is it? It's maintenance on people's faces, okay? And so, you know, when we're trying to be people of hope, and we want people to see that beautiful face, it's supported by a whole lot of small maintenance. And that maintenance looks like character building. And the way that we continue to build that character is as people of faith, we never say, why did I get this terrible hand? We just say, how can I play the hand that I've been dealt? Okay, and we've all been dealt an interesting hand. But God's with us, and God's going to be with us through these challenging times and through what we face together. And, you know, let's just remember as we come into our time of communion, one of the important lessons of communion is just simply Jesus saying, I'm here with you, and we're going to share this communion together. And when Jesus says that, the disciples say, but that can't be true because you just told us you're going to die. And Jesus said, when I tell you my word, that I'm going to be with you guys. Trust in me, okay? And here we are 2,000 years later on this beautiful Sunday morning, and here's Jesus right here with us, welcoming us to this table, okay? A place where there is suffering, also a place where character is built. And we find ourselves coming away every Sunday saying, I want to recommit myself to being a person of integrity and character, and I'm not going to be afraid during those times when I find myself and suffering. So let's join together in this time of communion. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, earlier today at the outdoor service, we were listening to the beautiful, same beautiful music that Allison just played. And in the background was the sounds of your wonderful world, birds singing, talking to each other, kids playing, the leaves rustling in the wind. You have created such a wonderful, beautiful world and so many wonderful things. 
But as we gather around this table, we know the most beautiful thing that you have ever created was your son, Jesus Christ. And so we give you thanks today, knowing that he is our greatest gift because he offers us eternal life. So as we partake of this bread, we ask that you bless it and that way we remember and thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take this cup, we realize that all of us have went through seasons of struggle, and some of us may be going through those today. Lord, those struggles include fear, doubt, a sense of hopelessness. But Lord, as we take this cup and we realize that Jesus laid his life on that cross for us, and even though that he may have departed this earth, he left us with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for your unconditional love and never leaving us because you gave us the Holy Spirit and you help us through that. You help us endure anything that we're going through, which creates our development, our strength, and gives us hope and peace. Lord, we thank you for all that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Some of the oldest words of scripture we have in the New Testament, and many of us have memorized them as we join together in these words for communion. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And again, these words from Scripture. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Medford, Oklahoma. Population 961. In this tiny Oklahoma farm town, there is one flashing traffic light, no hospital, and five churches. One of those churches is Medford First Church of the Nazarene. And the pastor of this small but faithful church has a crazy idea. Oh, and did I mention it's 1989? Even though they had limited funds and no real youth group to speak of, the pastor proposed to the board that they hire a youth pastor, even though they knew they could only afford to pay one for a single year. One of the couples on the board were humble farmers and teachers named Don and Millie. Don and Millie had been faithful givers for years, and even though the idea didn't seem to make much sense to them, they gave faithfully as they always had to help hire a youth pastor. The youth pastor they hired was a young guy named Mike. Even though his ministry in Medford was short, Mike had a great impact on a number of students in the small community. One student in particular was named Travis. After the year was up and Mike had to leave, unfortunately the youth group sort of fizzled out a bit. But the student that Mike had impacted most eventually ended up at Southern Nazarene University in Bethany, Oklahoma, where he studied to become a youth pastor himself. Travis's second gig as a youth pastor took him and his wife to the First Church of the Nazarene in Pueblo, Colorado. There, they had a profound impact on many students over a span of seven years. One student in particular gave up his longtime goal of becoming a chiropractor to accept a call to be a pastor, largely in part to Travis's example and guiding. In fact, as a result of Travis's focus on spiritual depth and discipleship, Five different students ended up going to Southern Nazarene University where they all studied to go into full-time ministry. During their time at Southern Nazarene University, the very same student who gave up his dream of being a chiropractor to be a pastor met and eventually married the love of his life. Not long after they started their lives together, they moved to Florida and currently serve at Highland Park Church. Their names are Tommy and Mindy. So let's recap. Don and Millie gave faithfully to the church in Medford, which allowed the church to hire Mike, a youth pastor, for just one year. As a result of Mike's ministry, Travis ended up becoming a youth pastor himself. And as a result of Travis's ministry, five people ended up going into full-time ministry. One of those being Tommy, who wouldn't have met the love of his life if it wasn't for Travis helping him to accept his call to ministry. Tommy and Mindy got married and now live in Florida. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Mindy is the granddaughter of Don and Millie. So even though it took over 20 years to see the result, God blessed Don and Millie for their faithful giving by giving them a very handsome grandson. And the effects of their faithfulness are still being felt literally across the globe. Even when we can't see it, God always blesses and multiplies our faithfulness and generosity. I love that video. We're going to watch that video until you have it all memorized. Uh, yeah, so we're doing things here. We're planting seeds right here, right now, that are going to show fruits in the future of Salem and the United States and the world. So thank you for your faithfulness, and um, thank you for the support that you've given us uh, to be able to do so many exciting things as we've helped one another. Let's join together in our doxology. <clears throat> Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the earth. 
And our hymn of invitation is a chance for anyone to come forward and join this wonderful fellowship we call First Christian Church, and also a time for all of us that are a part of this church to recommit ourselves to the ministry of this church as we sing together our hymn of invitation. God of grace and God of glory. God of grace and God of glory on thy is going to give our benediction today. Sam's heading off to summer camp, trek camp for the very first time. So she's going to have a big adventure on her hands here in a week. And we're looking forward to, um, to having her with us. Um, have you heard the bad news yet? Yeah, bad news. About your canoe partner? Oh, that's the bad news. It's my brother, Doug. The good news is he's nothing like Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to break the bad news right before the benediction, Sam. I think you're going to have a good time. She's going to bring her benediction. Sam? Dear God, um, I want to thank you for this day. And I want to thank you for all the students who have completed another school year. Mm -hmm. And we pray that ne this week... For vacation Bible school will go really well. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sam. Let's join together as we close. With the Spirit Song. With the Spirit yes. Song. Yes. Sam, Come stay up here with support me. Vacation Bible School this week. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and by your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Go in peace. Have a blessed week. Thanks, Sam.